Okay, today we're gonna to talk about 9.4, getting closer and closer to the end, economics in the global age. Uh, we're gonna be in the economic systems theme today. And what you need to know is that with the end of the Cold War, many governments are gonna start encouraging free market economic policies and they promote economic liberalization. When you see that phrase, economic liberalization, it just means more individuals getting to make more of their own economic choices um, and uh, less government interference or regulation in in the operations of, of business. Revolutions in information and communication technology will lead to the growth of what we call knowledge economies in some regions, while industrial production and manufacturing are gonna become increasingly situated in Asia and Latin America. And finally, free, make, free market economic principles are gonna spread throughout the world with the developing economic institutions, multinational corporations, and regional trade agreements. So let's take a look at free market economics. In the late 20th century, we bring this push towards economic liberalization and support for free market economics. In the United States and Great Britain through the 1980s, leaders like Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher will advocate reducing taxes, cutting government regulation, and advocation of free market principles, um, both in their countries and with their trade relationships abroad. Corporations will also take an opportunity with reduced transportation and communication costs to begin to offshore manufacturing uh, to places that offered cheaper labor and fewer government regulations, in particular things like uh, environmental regulations that would raise the cost of doing business. Ronald Reagan's economic policies became known as Reaganomics. Uh, this is what we call supply side economics, reducing taxes on businesses with the hope of stimulating economic growth. His opponents referred to this as trickle down economics, as if um, giving tax breaks to the wealthiest in, in uh, society would then send benefits down to the lower um, earners in society. Uh, we would see reductions of government spending in the 1980s and beyond in the United States on social welfare programs and reducing government regulations. Um, this will also tighten the money supply so as to limit inflation. Please note that this is like the opposite of what we were talking about in the aftermath of the Great Depression, where governments are going to take a more active role in their economies. Uh, in South America, Chilean dictator Augusto Pinochet, we talked about him and his brutal death squads in the last video, uh, moved his nation's economy from a, a, a one of state control towards a free market approach, privatizing state-run businesses, failing, uh, but while doing this, he failed to address social and issues and economic poverty. And as we've already talked about with Pinochet, his brutal oppression of his uh, political opponents was used to limit any dissent against his, his programs. In the 1980s, Deng Xiaoping in China began to economically liberalize the Chinese communist state and created a uh, market-based solutions to some of the economic problems in China. Uh, this will increase consumer production in factories uh, China will encourage foreign companies to set up operations in China and will allow some private ownership of businesses in China. There will be pushes for increased political freedoms in China as well, but those will be met with harsh repression, including the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre, where thousands of students would be violently suppressed and killed by the Chinese military as they protested for more political freedom. Now let's take a look at these knowledge economies. Uh, knowledge economies are, are economies that focus on the creation and the distribution and the use of knowledge and information rather than manufacturing. Designers, engineers, educators are all part of the knowledge economies. In the United States, we're gonna see this manifest in technological developments based in and around Silicon Valley in California. In Finland, economic growth through, these, uh, through this knowledge economy with a focus on sciences and technological development, especially in the area of mobile phone technology and cellular technology. In Japan, a strong focus on manufacturing evolved in, into the development of a knowledge-based economy in the late 20th century with some of the developments of the world's most innovative technology companies, uh, including Sony and Nintendo in Japan. As these knowledge economies have grown in some areas, we see shifting manufacturing locations to Asia and Latin America. 
Places like Vietnam and Bangladesh have become centers of industrial manufacturing of clothing and shoemaking as wages were far less than their Western counterparts. And so we end up seeing massive factories uh, that, that bring in thousands of workers um, to, to manufacture at very low wages. In Latin America, manufacturing is going to grow tremendously, especially after the NAFTA agreement, the North American Free Trade Agreement and the Central American Free Trade Agreement. These agreements will allow goods to be moved, manufactured in countries like Mexico or Honduras and brought to the United States with few economic barriers to trade. Now, the late 20th century is also going to bring a growth in regional organizations and transnational trade agreements that encourage these free trade practices between member nations. Uh, to know a few of them, the GATT, or the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, signed in 1947 in the aftermath of, the war, of World War II, nations would agree to limit tariffs. Now, this is mostly the United States and Western European allies. Remember, this is that idea of the United States that has existed since Woodrow Wilson, that the more nations trade with each other, the less likely they would be to go to war with each other. In 1995, the World Trade Organization was, is born that creates rules to oversee international trade and encourage more open markets between states. And then as we just mentioned, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, which would open up markets and, and limit trade barriers between the United States, Mexico, and Canada. This was recently replaced with a similar agreement between those three countries, uh, but the goal is still the same, to limit trade barriers between these nations. Now, as technology has, and transportation have advanced to the point that where we're at today, we see multinational co corporations um, that are legally incorporated in one nation, but with business operations in uh, many others. Now, we already talked about multinational corporations or transnational corporations um, in um, the 19th century, where we mentioned a couple like Unilever and the HSBC. Um, those actually still exist. In fact, we can see Unilever right there. Those still exist. However, now we have hundreds more massive multinational corporations, if not thousands. Um, the uh, companies like Microsoft, Google, Apple are American tech multinationals. Nestle is a Swiss company, the largest food company in the world. They make a lot more than just chocolate. Mahindra and Mahindra in India produces vehicles and electrical engineering, uh, electrical energy for global markets. So what do you want to take from this economics unit? The late 20th century sees a move to economic liberalism and more free trade policies amongst nations. Information and communications technologies lead to the growth of knowledge economies in many nations. And finally, multinational corporations will expand their reach around the world, but they're often going to find criticism uh, as they take advantage of cheaper labor and regulations in some nations. And we're going to talk in our next section about some of those, uh, those reactions to these multinational corporations. See you next time.